In The Expanse Season 5, Earth is ravaged with asteroids sent by Marco Inaros, who leads a militant Belter rebellion against Earth and Mars. Naomi is imprisoned by Marco and their son, Philip. She jumps through space to escape, and Alex dies saving her. Amos and Clarissa fight to survive on an apocalyptic Earth. Holden struggles to contain the protomolecule, Fred Johnson is killed, and in the finale, a rogue Martian faction leaves the solar system for a new world called Laconia, and one of their ships is destroyed by mysterious alien entities. So, what's going on here? This video has no spoilers from the books, just stuff from the TV show up to season 5. So, for generations, the people of Mars have worked to terraform the planet into a habitable world, with breathable air and life. But in Season 3, the alien ring gates opened up hundreds of already habitable worlds, planets like Illus that have life and rich resources. So Mars is now obsolete, people start leaving. But Mars still has a heap of advanced military gear lying around, and with its government in disarray, stuff goes missing. Bobby and Alex discover a conspiracy in the military to give advanced Martian warships to Marco Anaros and his free navy. In return, Marco gives them the protomolecule sample that he steals from Fred. In the finale, we learn that this Martian conspiracy is led by someone called Admiral Duarte, and Duarte's Martians take a whole fleet of ships and yeet out of the solar system through the ring gate, because they made a deal that Marco can have the Sol system while Duarte's faction rule a system called Laconia. This has actually been hinted at all season. If you zoom in on the opening credits, it shows a Martian ship flying to Laconia. So on Laconia, Duarte has the scientist Cortazar studying mysterious alien structures and experimenting with the protomolecule. Remember that billions of years ago, there was an alien civilization called the Builders. The Builders created the protomolecule as a tool to build these ring gates. But the protomolecule also has the potential to be a weapon, or to transform the human species. In Season 2, Cortazar said that the protomolecule learns and changes, that it devours old constructs and recreates them. It seems that Duarte and his Martians want to recreate the dream of Mars. A conspirator said that the dream of Mars isn't dead, it's about to be writ large. Sorvater says that Mars is not just one planet, it's a vision of humanity that can encompass a thousand stars. He says that Laconia will be pure and unified, strict and militant. The name Laconia refers to Sparta in ancient Greece, which is renowned as a military society. So Juarte has started a whole new faction of Martian military on the distant world of Laconia, empowered by alien technology, but they're playing with fire. One of Juarte's ships enters the Laconia ring and is suddenly destroyed by mysterious alien entities. These are the creatures that killed the Builders billions of years ago, using weapons like that artifact on Illus, and now these entities are a threat to humans too. So Season 5 shatters the balance of power in the Expanse, with Laconia splitting off from Mars, Earth devastated, Marco's free navy rising in the belt, and strange aliens haunting the ring gates. But at the same time as all this sci-fi and politics, this season is also deeply personal, with Amos, Naomi, and Alex each going on journeys to face their pasts. Amos grew up in Baltimore. As a child, his name was Timothy, and he was sexually exploited as a child prostitute, then worked as muscle in organized crime. A woman named Lydia was like a mother to Timothy. And she taught him that even if you're not a good person, you can still live like a good person. You can pretend to be righteous. Because Amos doesn't feel empathy for others. Hurting people makes him feel good. He can't tell right from wrong. He's a damaged person. But by following a guiding light like Lydia or Naomi or Holden, Amos can learn to do the right thing and live a good life. Lydia has died, so Amos pays his respects to her husband, Charles, and then visits his old friend, Eric. 
Back in the day, Timothy's boss was Amos Burton, and Burton ordered Timothy to kill Eric. Timothy killed Burton instead and took Burton's identity to escape Earth and start a new life as Amos. Now Eric is a crime boss himself, and Amos gets him to provide housing for Charles. And before leaving Earth forever, Amos visits Clarissa. In season three, Clarissa murdered a bunch of people, trying to get revenge on Holden for imprisoning her father. But afterwards, Amos made friends with Clarissa. So he visits her in an underground prison called The Pit. Clarissa is in a deep, dark place, emotionally and literally. So Amos helps and supports Clarissa in the same way that Naomi and Lydia helped him, which goes to show how much Amos has grown. While they're in the pit, one of Marco's asteroids hits America, and they have to work together to climb out of the darkness into the light, like a metaphor for escaping their emotional pain. They also kick a cybernetically enhanced super thug in the balls, which is a metaphor for kicking their emotional pain in the balls. Amos still isn't good at this talking about your feelings stuff, so he's almost glad when the world starts ending and they've got a fight to survive. Violence, he understands. Amos says that in times of conflict, human groups fracture into small, hostile tribes. But Clarissa has a more optimistic, inclusive perspective, and she convinces Amos to help some refugees escape Earth. With the help of Eric, they find a ship and fight some goons and fly to safety on the moon. There, Eric asks Amos to come with him to start a crime gang like the old days. But Amos rejects his dark past and chooses a more optimistic future. He brings Clarissa to join the Rosi crew, arguing that even murderous enemies can become trusted friends. So Amos suffered terrible trauma and violence, and he can never fully escape that past. But he can learn to be better and help others to be better too. Amos survives the churn by growing his tribe. Naomi also faces her past. Years ago, she was involved with Belter radicals Marco, Sin, and Corral. Naomi and Marco had a baby called Philip. Marco was passionate and charismatic, but was also an emotionally manipulative, narcissistic terrorist. He used some computer code that Naomi wrote to blow up a ship called the Gamara, killing 500 people. Naomi was horrified and tried to leave, so Marco took baby Philip away from her. Naomi became desperate and depressed and almost committed suicide out an airlock. She did manage to start a new life, but always felt guilty about the child she left behind. In season five, she and Philip finally reunite. Naomi hopes to save her son from being used by Marco like she was. But Philip stays loyal to his controlling father, and Naomi is imprisoned on Marco's ship. Series creator Ty Frank says Marco is like a bad guy version of Holden. They're both brave, passionate leaders who fight for what they believe in, but where Holden is selfless and compassionate and honest, Marco is a selfish, cruel liar and murderer who commits the worst mass killing in history. Sin is more friendly with Naomi. He was always a brotherly, protective figure to her, kind of like Amos. Naomi's actress, Dominic Tipper, says that that similarity might be what drew Naomi to Amos in the first place. Naomi tries desperately to convince Philip to leave Marco, but ultimately he rejects her, and Naomi is again unable to save her son. So Naomi escapes by jumping through the vacuum of space unprotected to another ship, which apparently is scientifically possible if you're quick, especially since Naomi injects herself with oxygenated blood. She suffers swelling and radiation burns and almost dies, but that's just the beginning of her torment. Because Naomi is stuck inside a trap designed to lure and kill her friends. It's a disabled ship with a fake distress call rigged to explode using Naomi's own code from the Gamara, it's like Naomi's past has been weaponized to destroy her. But Naomi uses her skills and her grit to survive this hellish trap. She leaps into space again to warn her friends and is rescued by Alex and Bobby. Alex goes back to Mars to reconnect with his ex-wife and son, who he had left behind to go be a pilot. 
But his ex rejects him, and Alex has to accept that some mistakes can't be fixed. So he helps Bobby investigate black market Martian military gear. He talks to Solvater and Babbage, who are both secretly working for Juarte, and they chase after the conspirators, and Bobby does heroic Bobby things. Alex and Bobby are both loyal Martians, and they're furious that the government that they fought for has betrayed them. They grieve that the dream of Mars is dying. When Naomi is in danger, they race in to save her. Flying at a high-G burn is always dangerous. They use the juice to reduce the risk of stroke, but it's always a roll of the dice, and this time it goes against them, and Alex dies. Alex's last words are, that was one hell of a ride. All he ever wanted to do was to fly and to fight to do good with his crew. So dying to save Naomi after a crazy ride in the Razorback is a fitting death for this Martian space cowboy. So while Amos, Naomi, and Alex go off on their own journeys, Holden is left alone. He's lonely without his crew, but soon Monica and Fred keep him busy. Because Monica gets kidnapped and they save her, but then Marco's men attack and kill Fred. Fred was the voice for peace and cooperation between the Belt and Inner Planets, and he was almost like a father figure to Holden. He had just told Holden to live life while he can, and now he's dead. When Marco's men steal Fred's protomolecule sample, Holden, Bull, and Monica chase after it. When they find out Naomi is in danger, Holden wants to charge in and save her, but he realizes that this time he can't help her, and the protomolecule is more important. This is the opposite of what happened in season two, when Holden was obsessed with hunting down the protomolecule, but then learned to let it go, because in that case, saving Naomi was more important. Once upon a time, Holden was a heroic white knight who always knew what was right and wanted to save everyone all the time. Now, he's much more mature and wise, able to compromise and make difficult choices about what's right. Last season, Drummer left the OPA because she was done with having to sacrifice lives for the sake of politics. So now she sets her own path as a polyamorous space pirate captain. She has a family of five other belters on a couple of ships and extorts people for resources in her part of space. But like every other character this season, the past comes back to haunt her. She finds the ship of Ashford, who was killed by Marco last season. Previously, Drummer and Ashford had captured Marco and would have killed him, but Drummer spared Marco, leading to Ashford's death. So Drummer suffers grief and guilt over the death of her friend. Drummer had always been so tough and professional, but now we see her vulnerable, intimate side and her relationships with her partners. When Marco rises to power with the Free Navy, Drummer has no choice but to join the man who killed two of her friends, her longtime ally Fred, as well as Ashford. Drummer's partner Oksana says for the safety of their family, they must stay loyal to Marco. But then Drummer learns that Naomi is in danger from Marco. Naomi and Drummer survived the behemoth together. They danced and handballed together. Naomi built Drummer's robot legs when she was paralyzed. So Drummer won't let Marco kill another of her friends. She rebels against Marco, attacks his ships, helps save Naomi, and reclaims her independence. But there's a terrible cost. Marco kills one of Drummer's partners, and Oksana blames Drummer, so her family breaks apart. Last season, Avasarala was the most powerful person on Earth, but after losing her election, she's relegated to the moon and the government doesn't listen to her anymore. Her daughter says she should just go home and patch things up with her estranged husband, Arjun, but Avasarala's whole identity and purpose is to use politics to protect Earth, and she finds evidence of Marco's plan to throw stealth rocks at Earth. By the time anyone listens, it's too late. Earth is devastated, and Arjun is one of the dead. The new acting Secretary General retaliates against Marco with an attack that kills thousands of Belter civilians. In the past, Avasarala probably would have supported this. 
She agreed to the destruction of Deimos in Season 2 and attacked a civilian ship last season, but now she doesn't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. Killing civilians will only create more terrorists, and Avasarala feels responsible to protect not just Earthers, but all people, so she resigns in protest of the attack. And it works. Others resign with her, the power shifts, and Avasarala becomes Secretary General again, the once and future Queen. In the end, she calls for unity among Earth, Mars, and the Belt, as they face the new threats of the Free Navy and Laconia. So, in Season 5, the sins of the past come back to punish the protagonists. Marco's Free Navy arose from a century of oppression of the Belters by Earth and Mars. Naomi is almost destroyed by Marco using her own computer code. Juarte and Laconia's protomolecule sample is the one that Naomi refused to destroy back in Season 2. Naomi fails to save Philip, Holden fails to contain the protomolecule, Alex fails to repair his past, Drummer fails to protect her family, Avasarala fails to protect Earth. This season is the Empire Strikes Back of the Expanse, in that the good guys lose. If there's any hope in this story, maybe it's in Amos and Clarissa, who emerge from trauma and apocalypse with new optimism and unity. Thanks for watching. We made four videos for The Expanse Season 5 with the support of our sponsor, Amazon Prime Video UK. So please check out their channel at the link below. Thanks to patrons Brendan Davis, Willie Hardy, Mike Batko, Ross Maverick, Ben Dieter, Stanislav, Ian Feibig, Huang Nguyen, and Demps2002. Cheers.